Since going all in on this outdoors cooking, I've done a lot of reading about seasoning cast iron. There seems to be a lot of uh, hearsay out there and, and everyone thinks they've got their best way of doing it. But really I want to know what the heck is seasoning cast iron, why do we want to do it, and uh, what's the best way of doing it. So in this video, I'm going to share with you what I've found according to science. There's three reasons we season cast iron. One, to create a non-stick layer for cooking. Two, to prevent rust and corrosion of the cast iron. And three, to create a barrier between our food and the cast iron. So chemicals don't leach from the cast iron into your food. I watched an awesome YouTube video by a channel called Eater. They did a feature on a craft foundry in New York named Borough Furnace. Beautiful handcrafted cast iron cookware. At about the seven minute mark, they start talking about seasoning and they mention flaxseed oil, fatty acids, hard drying, polymerization, and I had to learn more, I was hooked. Their standard Dutch oven season is 330 Australian dollars without shipping, and you'd be lucky to get one on a six month lead time. So I was thinking, if this family owned, high quality crafts business um, is using this technique, then there must be something to it. And that led me down this path. With a bit more reading, I found that season on cast iron is a dried layer of oil providing a tough barrier adhered to the iron. Not dried in the sense of water evaporating, but dried as in a series of chemical reactions. We want the oil to polymerize and form a hard, thin coating on the cast iron surface and temperature is the best way to make this occur. And this is how it happens. When you get an oil above its smoke point, it begins to degrade. Part of those degradation reactions is the release of free radicals, and these free radicals allow cross-linking of the oil and, the, and create a polymer network. And so as these reactions happen, you end up with a hard, um, bonded, polymerized layer of oil left over. So the word free radical might sound like four hippies in a V-dub combi at a peace rally, but it's not. It means a molecule that's got an uneven number of electrons, which makes it highly reactive to many things around it. For this reason, it can make you acutely ill, and also it's a strong carcinogen if you eat or breathe in smoking oil as it's smoking. So be really careful when you do this. You've got to make the right precautions. If a monomer is one molecule, then a polymer is a whole bunch of molecules fused together. The simplest way I can kind of describe this is imagine cooking spaghetti. You've broken up the long spaghettis into thirds, you've put them in a pot, you've cooked it, you've got rid of the water, and now you're left with a saucepan of spaghetti. Well, that's a whole bunch of monomers sitting next to each other. But imagine if they all grew arms and legs and they all grabbed onto each other and they were fused there permanently. That's a polymer network, or a, that is a polymerized material, a cross-linked polymerized material, rather than a monomer now. So that's, the, that's what happens. It basically, you go from individual molecules to a bonded network of molecules formed together. El dente. Once this occurs when you're seasoning, it's actually more like a plastic than an oil. I stumbled across the blog of a lady who seems even more obsessed about this than I am, Cheryl Cantor, and she went on to articulate, based on science, what the best oil for, for seasoning cast iron would be. So I went about trying to find other sources to support this. Thanks very much, Cheryl. The oils that create the toughest polymer coating are known as hard drying oils. They're characterized by having high levels of polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids, especially alpha-linolenic acid, ALA. ALA makes the oil particularly susceptible to degradation with oxygen and temperature. So consider searing a steak. You never want to get above the smoke point and start degrading the oil, but for seasoning, that's exactly what we want. Seasoning is not cooking. We want an oil that readily degrades and forms a hard polymerized layer on the surface, a hard drying oil. There's an oil that an artist would use to mix with high quality pigments to make a high quality oil paint. 
It's the same oil that a woodworker or wood turner would use to create a low sheen, high performance finish on a, on a bit of wood. And it's the same oil that you'd use as a lubricant and a corrosion inhibitor on tooling in a workshop. It's linseed oil, except it's not linseed oil in our case. It's flaxseed oil, the edible version of linseed oil. Flaxseed oil is actually the only edible hard drying oil. If you compare it to other common recommendations like bacon fat, dripping, grapeseed oil, avocado oil, these are all semi-hard drying oils at best. If ALA or alpha linolenic acid is the key indicator of uh, its ability to create that polymerized network, recall free radicals, more free radicals equals more cross-linking equals a harder polymer. If that's the case, then um, flaxseed oil has about six times the amount of ALA than canola oil does. So that's the kind of magnitude of how much more effective it is compared to a normal everyday cooking oil. Flaxseed oil also has the lowest smoke point out of all edible oils at just 225 degrees Celsius. This makes it highly reactive to temperature and also when exposed to oxygen. Virgin cold pressed flaxseed oil is so reactive it needs to be refrigerated all along the supply chain, all the way to your kitchen fridge. The bottle that I bought even says on the packaging, do not heat. That's how susceptible it is for degrading at temperature. Be prepared to spend between 10 and $30 for about 200 ml of oil in Australia. You'll find it in organic health food stores where all the free radicals hang out and it'll be in the fridge section. Read the fine print, the best ones are ones that need to be refrigerated all the way along. When you're done with it, it's bloody good for you, so just um, make a smoothie or put it on your cereal. I actually emailed Borough Furnace in America and asked them some questions and I was totally stoked that they actually replied. So thanks very much Liz if you ever watch this. What they said was basically three answers to my questions. One was about an hour is enough above the smoke point to get the job done. Secondly, if you underdo it, you'll end up with it quite tacky um, and it just means it'll, it'll peel off if you try to put another layer on top. So you need a, need a kind of sound layer each time you build it. And lastly, they said don't leave it for too long or too hot because if you do that, then it will burn and you get like a charred layer. This actually happened to me I basically got this black powder and it got like a matte finish. So if you've got a matte finish at the end of it, you've probably had it too hot and burnt the layer. You should have a kind of sheen to it once you're done. All right, here's how I did it. You want to wash it in the sink with steel wool, scourers, steel brushes, anything you need in order to take off the existing seasoning and get a nice reactive cast iron surface. Dry it off with a tea towel and put your oven on keep warm or its lowest setting. And then once you've dried it with a tea towel, put it, put it in the oven and leave it there for about 15 minutes. You don't want any water on it at all. Take it out, get your um, flaxseed oil, pour a bit on, um, on a few spots. And I found that using my hand was the best way to work it in and rub it in rather than using paper towel. So that's up to you. You can use paper towel to wipe it on, but I, I found that just using my hand was the best way to do it. And as you know, if there's a messy option for the channel, take it. Once you've wiped it on, you want to immediately wipe it off. Um, so using a paper towel, just gently wipe it off. The more sterile the environment is, i.e. the less dust and other stuff and the cleaner your hands are and, and whatever, the better. Uh, I found that using cheap paper towel left little, uh, little bits of stuff um, that, that collected in there and so you really want to kind of leave nothing there but the oil so just be careful how you do it. Next you want to put it on the heat. I decided to do this outside rather than in my kitchen oven just because the free radicals and the, the byproducts of the smoke are quite harmful, so I didn't want that in the house. So I did it on the Weber kettle. I set it up to, for direct cooking. Originally, I put an extra trivet in there to, to raise it closer to the grill so that it was maximum heat, but I think that's, that, that was what made it too hot. So I just put it down to the normal amount and filled up the charcoal starter about three quarters full. 
220 degrees isn't that high, so you don't need to like absolutely blast the thing. You know, your kind of normal high heat cooking temp is, is all you need. Leave it at temperature for one hour, take it off the heat, let it cool down naturally. From that point on, no more steel wool or scourers, just water and a cloth, wipe it out, and then repeat the process. Dry it fully once you've rinsed it, apply the oil, take the oil off, put it back on the heat. So you're just doing that cycle in a methodical, repeated way. I've done this three times now, I'm gonna do it a couple more times, so I'll report back. Some people say doing it five, six, seven, eight times is, is best. Um, so we'll see how we go, I'll let you know what I find. The cooking fuel and the oil is not cheap itself, and so the best way that I've found to do it is to just set up for cooking. So you light the charcoal, put the charcoal in, and then before you put your food in, you just leave this thing in there for an hour, take it out, and then by that time there's no, um, there's no harmful stuff left there, it's all dried, and so then you can just cook on it. So that's the best way. Most, most charcoal will, um, will last for at least a couple of hours, and, and uh, if you're using gas, you'll be fine anyway. So yeah, don't, don't think like you have to go to the hassle of doing just that. You know, do it while you're cooking and sort of economy of effort. Quick edit, folks. I've done it five times now. I think that'll do me. It's got a nice sheen to it. It looks like it's got a tough layer there. Certainly, once I got to the third layer, applying the oil became much easier, so I think it's more slippery and more smooth than when I started. I'm going to do some cooking, do some experimenting, and I'll report back in a future video about how I think this has gone. It's kind of like painting a wall. If you put the time into the preparation and you're methodical with each coat, it'll turn out really good. You know? If you sand the wall back nicely, you use sugar soap to prepare the surface, your primer goes on, your base coat goes on, your top coat goes on. If everything's done to a methodical standard, the end result's gonna be awesome. But if you don't let the primer cure long enough or you don't sand the wall, then no matter how many top coats you put on, you're not gonna hide the fact that you haven't done that work. Same with this cast iron. You can't afford to skip steps because it will expose you later. You've just gotta take your time, prepare it, build it layer on layer methodically for the best result. Once you've built the foundation using this method, every time you cook in that cast iron, you're adding layers of seasoning with normal oils that you're using, or semi-drying oils. This is what people mean when they say, my cast iron's got character, or it's unique, the, the flavors are unique. Every time you cook in cast iron, you're building on that layer of seasoning. That's enough talk from me. If you're new here, please feel free to check out some of my other videos. And if you've liked what you've seen, please consider subscribing to support the channel and come back for more. Thanks very much. See you soon. Sorry? Uh, it's easy. I know it looks silly, but it's actually, I feel like it's a better application when I use my hands. <laughs>